Hello, my name is Dr. Snowden. Thank you for your interest in the UA Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. My group is involved in organic synthesis and drug discovery. And I'd like to give you an overview of some work that we've completed recently and also an ongoing project to give you a feel for the type of chemistry that we're interested in. This slide shows three projects that we've recently completed. One of those projects is a new strategic route to prepare deoxy-C glycoside structures. I'll talk briefly about that in just a minute. We also, in collaboration with researchers at Georgia Tech, VCU, and the University of Mainz, completed a scalable synthesis of the HIV drug, tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate. The idea behind this was to come up with a route that is less expensive than the commercial route in order to reduce the price of TDF so that it can be purchased and administered to individuals in third world countries to potentially save lives from those who have HIV infection. Another project that we spent a couple of years working on was the development of DOT1L inhibitors. These are protein methyltransferase inhibitors that may serve as anti-cancer agents. And I'll talk about that project specifically in just a minute as well. And then a current project with a representative example is shown in the bottom right of this slide. And that's a potential development of what would be a first in class compound. So there's nothing of this type known that can serve to degrade a specific protein associated with HIV infection. Uh, and this type of antiviral treatment could be a, a new approach for treatment of a wide range of viral infections. And uh, what we hope to do is demonstrate it through HIV treatments first. In terms of synthetic methodology, we've spent time working with a reaction called the Yosic reaction or the yosic reeve reaction. This involves the conversion of a trichloromethylcarbonyl upon introduction of a base such as sodium hydroxide or cesium carbonate into a protic solution. What that does is promotes an intramolecular substitution reaction where a gem dichloroepoxide is formed as an intermediate structure. These intermediates are very interesting in that they're latent dielectrophiles, meaning that there are two carbons in these structures which are electrophilic. That allows one to introduce two nucleophiles or a tethered nucleophile to these intermediates to form far more complex product structures. We've used this approach to prepare a number of different product classes, including unsaturated substituted carboxylic acids. We've conducted a number of reactions in which we can prepare one carbon homologated alcohols or aldehydes very conveniently and in high yield. We provided a means to prepare chiral 2,4 disubstituted butyrolactones and then applied those in a small total synthesis project. And most recently, we've used the gem dichloroepoxide intermediates to be able to develop a very short and efficient synthesis of deoxy-C glycosides. These are substructures which are commonly found in biologically active natural products. This particular transformation involves starting from commercially available Winberg lactone, converting the Winberg lactone into an enone structure with, you'll note, a chiral trichloromethylcarbonyl present at this position. That's the the key functionality in the structure that's going to allow us to form the five or six membered ring products. These particular intermediates are transformed into tetraols through asymmetric synthesis. And then we found that those tetraols can selectively cyclize to form substituted five membered rings. And some example compounds are shown at the bottom of the slide. This is very powerful in that we can predictably access any single stereoisomer or complete libraries of stereoisomers using the single synthetic strategy. These are examples of just a few of the many complex natural products which contain this particular chiral furan moiety. One compound of particular interest is synparvalide C. And I'd like to have a student use our new strategy for forming the red portion of this structure to create this chiral natural product to showcase the utility of the synthetic strategy and the efficiency by which a relatively complex structure of this type could be prepared. 
One of our major projects over the past couple of years has been the discovery of a lead compound as a DOT1L inhibitor. DOT1L is an epigenetic control enzyme. It's a protein lysine methyltransferase enzyme. And epigenetic control enzymes are critically important in that they effectively act as gene switches in the body. That is, they have dynamic control over whether or not protein expression takes place by turning on or shutting off particular genes. DOT1L itself is responsible for the di and trimethylation of histone 3 lysine 79. This particular position in certain genes is associated with various cancers. Initially, we were interested in targeting a very aggressive form of pediatric leukemia for which there is no current cure or effective treatment. That's called a mixed lineage leukemia, where DOT1L plays a key role. The idea is to inhibit the DOT1L enzyme, thereby not allowing expression of proteins, which allow the mixed lineage leukemia to manifest, which would be an effective treatment for that particularly nasty form of cancer. Before we got started in this project, a collaborator of mine at the UAB Medical School, as director of Doug Discovery at Southern Research Institute, uh, tested a compound library of over 1,200 compounds, and they found one structure in particular, which was a unique chemotype, meaning that there is no other structure that's been prepared that has the similar type of functional groups that are present in that compound, which made it unique and of interest. They noted that this particular compound was a weakly potent DOT1L inhibitor. It has an IC50 value of 45 micromolar. Normally, you would want something to be about 10 micromolar or less for it to serve as a potential lead compound. So this one didn't quite fit the bill. They brought me on board to help design analogs of this compound to see if we could find a structure which was both more potent and one which would be highly selective for inhibiting DOT1L while retaining the activity of other protein methyltransferases, which is important for normal cell health. We considered hundreds of different head groups and tail groups to attach to the core structure of this particular compound. Here are the tail groups and the head groups that we ultimately selected, guided by computational scoring in the DOT1L enzyme active site. So these particular structures that we identified through rational design scored very well and looked like they would be suitable DOT1L inhibitors. My group was involved in the synthesis of the corresponding compounds, and here's a subset of those structures. And what we found is the compound at the bottom, shown in red, was the most potent of the 16 compounds that we synthesized and had tested. That structure had an over 40-fold improvement in its DOT1L inhibitory potency compared to the initial SRI compound, which is pretty significant. Importantly, we found that the compound is not cytotoxic, so it can be introduced to normal healthy cells with no de deleterious effects to those cells. It shows very high protein methyltransferase selectivity, so it really only binds well with DOT1L and not other protein methyltransferases, which was an important characteristic of structures we might be interested in. And as I stated previously, it's a new chemotype, which means it's not patent protected and could be evolved further to a potential drug candidate. And that's something that we're considering at this point. The last project I want to briefly outline is one that we're currently working on. And you might recognize that traditional drugs commonly work by an occupancy-based inhibition approach. And what that means is they bind reversibly either to an active site or maybe to the site of a cofactor or to what's called an allosteric binding site in a protein associated with a disease. This works, of course, for many drugs, but there are problems associated with it. For compounds that bind in active sites, one of the major problems is that the cells or an organism, for example, if it's a bacterium, will potentially upregulate expression of the substrate, thereby outcompeting the inhibitor. And what is initially a potent drug can turn out to have limited potency once the substrate concentration is increased. 
There are other issues associated with occupancy-based inhibitor use, which can ultimately lead to drug resistance. Our interest is to create targeted protein degraders, or what are also referred to as proteolysis targeting chimeras or protex. These work very differently from conventional occupancy-based drugs. They form what are called ternary complexes because the protein becomes bound by a drug-like structure, which is tethered to what's known as an E3 ligase recruiter. This E3 ligase recruiter recruits enzymes from within the cell, which is infected, to promote the tagging of the protein, which results in its ultimate proteolysis or destruction within the cell. So this is very different from an occupancy-based inhibition approach. In this approach, the protein is not just competitively inhibited, it is actually destroyed. And in the process, the targeted protein degrader or PROTAC is restored so that it can act as a catalyst, which is not the case for most traditional drugs. Our initial target for this is the HIV-1 protein reverse transcriptase. The role of reverse transcriptase is to take HIV RNA and reverse transcribe it into viral DNA, which gets incorporated into T cell DNA so that viral particles can be generated over and over and over again. If you can inhibit reverse transcriptase or better yet destroy it through the action of a targeted protein degrader, you could potentially create a functional cure for HIV because the infected cells with the destroyed reverse transcriptase would no longer be able to incorporate their genetic material into the host DNA. The structure that we have in mind to bind to reverse transcriptase is a known non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. It's called ropivirine or RPV. And what we plan to do is attach linkers to a modified version of RPV, and then to that attach various E3 ligase recruiters to see if we can come up with a construct which will associate with RT, lead to its tagging, and then its ultimate proteolysis in infected T cells. And just to give you an idea of the structure, this is an RPV derivative that we're in the process of preparing. This would be a potential linker that could be used. And then the red portion is the E3 ligase recruiter, which is going to pull the biological machinery from within the T cells to the reverse transcriptase to promote its tagging and proteolysis. Students in my group become adept at asymmetric synthesis and also the synthesis and the purification of polar and polyfunctionalized heterocycles, drug-like molecules. We do a lot of reaction optimization associating physical organic chemistry concepts. We do both small scale, so one milligram to moderate, moderate scale syntheses, greater than 50 grams in some cases. Many people don't fully appreciate the different skills required to prepare something on a very, very small scale compared to a relatively large scale like described here. And my students tend to do both. We do a lot of one-dimensional and two-dimensional NMR work to characterize these relatively large organic structures that we prepare. And of course, we're involved in drug design and fundamental pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic considerations in the drug design process much of the work that we do also has a pathology context. So uh, there's a little bit of medicinal knowledge and biochemistry knowledge that's associated with much of the work we do, at least in the design of the target structures that we want to prepare. Here's a picture of my group from last year. It turns out that three of those students have graduated, so uh, they're no longer in the group. However, I do have two new graduate students and a new undergraduate who have joined the group. So I need to replace that picture once the pandemic allows us to gather as a group and, and take a new photo. Uh, here's a, a list of some of the agencies who have funded our work. I'm very grateful for that. And if you're interested in getting some more information about our group or maybe finding links to some of our publications, I encourage you to go to snowdengroup.org that's our group website, and you can find more information there. Right. I appreciate your attention, and I hope to see you in the fall at the University of Alabama.